is it? <laughs> Uh, Professor X and Iraqi, you actually wrote uh, a piece on this visit. It was published in, in, in the Standard yesterday, and I'll pull it up. Uh, but, but give us the gist of your thoughts on this yes, visit. This is, this is a very emotional issue to me mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. One of them is uh, I know three of my relatives, specifically uncles, who fought for the British in World War II. But they never got any pension. They never got any reward for that. The soldiers who fought for the empire from UK themselves got the big pieces of land we are talking about. Two people putting their, their, their life on duty on, on, uh, to risk. One is rewarded, one is not rewarded. And when Mamau came, I also know a number who got detained. They fought for the empire, but they also got detained. So, so you can see the contradiction. So I think on a humanitarian, pure humanitarian point of view, there's a need for apology. We're not talking about the people who lost their land, who are displaced. And the only offense was they happened to have been in Kenya when Britons came to take over this country. The problem with apology is that, as my colleague says, it opened a can of worms. Britons owned so much land, colonized so much part of this planet. So if they apologize in Kenya, they have to apologize from, from all over the world. Mm -hmm. In fact, they say there was a time when the, the sun never set over the empire. So, and doing all that would be very complicated. And I think that's why the Britons are very careful in terms of uh, apologizing. But that would be in order. But we also must consider the other issue that is at stake, which is land, very emotional. Somebody was saying a few minutes ago that the Britons transferred land from certain community to the Britons. Then when independence came, that land never got back to the original owners. So if we now take that line, it will be very complicated. But uh, I, I think uh, we cannot keep on going back in history. And one of my interesting observations I made about his visit, that he's coming to visit Kenya as a king. Yet the Britons destroyed our kingdoms. So you can see they destroyed our kingdom, but they kept theirs. So maybe by inviting him and welcoming him, we are saying it directly that we don't mind reviving our and maybe we should revive them so that uh, you never know, I might become Prince Iraqi. Reviving our kingdoms, yes. Prof, surely. Or I can become the Duke of Nairobi. Uh -huh. But I think, all in all, an apology would be in order. We are also very forgiving mm. as Africans. Too forgiving, some would say. Sometimes. But I think I would be very glad to see, him, to see Prince Charles apologizing to the Kenyan public, the victims of all those atrocities. Because uh -huh. they are documented, we know them. It's not something we are going to, to, to talk about, something we know very well. Now, I also need to correct something my colleague said. Mm -hmm. Mau Mau reparations. Mm -hmm. Only 5,000 5, people are paid. Mm -hmm. But how many people suffered under the British rule during the Mau Mau emergency? Very many people, mm -hmm. thousands. But only five were. He, he did say a small group. Very small group. Mm. And I can tell you for free from my own research, there were a lot of joy riders. Mm. A lot of joy riders were compensated, not the real Mau Mau. So we, need also, we also need uh, more people to be compensated if there are reparations or if there is compensation. And I hope that will be, be one of the subjects you're going to address when he comes here. All right. Um, he did say that, <laughs> okay, I don't know about the reparations, but he did say, sorry, the statement that was released uh, by the royal... I, it's not the entire family, I suppose, but their communications team was that you know he would it, it, it they, they're willing to look at the, it's a complicated history, so even the ugly, and uh, there was talk of acknowledging as you heard in that report uh, by Brian Mushiri Wangari Madai, but also uh, visiting uh, there to visit a memorial, I believe, uh, yeah, what they said is that with regard to the state to, of emergency. Mm -hmm. They're going to apologize for some of the more serious violations mm -hmm. which is um, now that is that that is that is now British politics eh? what do you mean some of the more serious uh -huh. <laughs> because the the entire colonial, colonial experience was serious requires an apology uh -huh. yes if you tell the Maasai that they well we took we, we took your land but well that wasn't one of the more serious violations uh -huh. That, that we should be apologizing for. I mean, what, how will they feel? 
So and, and you know, th th that is a problem that has not been resolved to date. Yes. For example. An unresolved apology is what I'm hearing. Oh, uh, have I pronounced it right? <laughs> if, if, if they were to give an, an apology, then it has to be unresolved. Uh -huh. Yes, but I don't think they will, they will have the courage to do that. Yes. But are we, are we on a, a most substantive issue? Why have we to wait for 60 years? Those are issues we should, we should have resolved a long time ago. So I, I think we also do blame as Kenyans for not pursuing that more vigorously. Interesting. Um, I'm curious, what do you make of it being, this is his first visit to a Commonwealth nation. Is it? Yes, since okay. his coronation. Uh, what do you make of the choice of Kenya? I know the president had extended an invitation. Do you make anything of it, Professor Ketch? Uh, not, not, partic not that I'm aware of. Uh -huh. it, just, it just so happened. Uh, it, I don't see anything yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think I see something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The British monarch has been very sentimental to this country because uh -huh. remember Prince Elizabeth became the queen when she was in this country, uh -huh. when she was at Tree Tops. And then there have been a lot of uh, British interest in this country, particularly strategic in terms of military training, mm. in terms of mm -hmm. investment. Mm -hmm. And then finally you have to remember that uh, UK or Britain got out of uh, Brexit, out of European Union, the so-called Brexit. And it makes logic that one way to turn to for more trade is a commonwealth. So commonwealth has become more important. And anywhere where Britons have interest, strategic interest, whether trade or otherwise, must be, they must now focus more on that. So I don't think it is random that they choose Kenya. Sentimentality. Yes. Th there was, uh, so the, the weekly review really went into this, but um, there's uh, Batuk, the, the Batuk factor. And uh, there was a gruesome killing of, uh, let me just see if I can find that particular article. I don't know whether I saw it in uh, yesterday's weekly review or it's also in, in one of the papers. The standard, but mm. you know, it will cast, according to the article, it was viewed that it would cast a pal on, on his visit uh, because they're also. So, Ngidna Kidori, one of our reporters here, also did a special report on the ordinance that has caused cost people their limbs and lives, um, as well as now the, uh, I'll have to remember her name, but basically atrocities committed by British forces in Kenya. It's post, a landmine. Post-independence. Post post-independence. Post, post it's a landmine issue. I'm not sure whether he will appro even approach that issue. Professor Miguel. Like the, the case of the, the lady that was killed by a British soldier. Yes. So, so the violations continue. You, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the unfortunate thing is that uh, you have these people coming here. I'm talking about the British soldiers. They are not accountable to uh, Kenyan law. How is that acceptable? So in your view, anyway, well, we may not get uh, a lot of these hard questions answered. Uh, Professor... Exen Iraqi, uh, the even the atrocities that followed <laughs> independence. I, I think uh, one of the, uh, my, the, the gentleman on my left is a lawyer, and I think justice is very clear in our national anthem, is our shield. So whatever injustice has been, has been perpetrated against Kenyans, it doesn't, matter, but, um, it doesn't matter by who. There should be people, there should be some, some form of compensation. There should be, there, we should not just talk about justice, but we should see justice in action. So whether it was somebody who was uh, killed in a, an ordinance explosion, whether it was somebody who was uh, involved in a scuttle with a British soldier, whether it is colonialism, we need to come to terms with all that. Because we have to move on and uh, share the burden of the past, but it must be done in a way that makes satisfies all the stakeholders. All right, so I'm, I will find it. I will find it. Uh, my memory today is letting me down, but I will find uh, that particular article even as I open yours. Uh, uh, what you penned, Professor Exen Iraqi. But uh, allow me to transition now into the topic of conversation that is intra African trade. Or should I give myself a few minutes just to flip through, see if I can find it? You need coffee. 
<laughs> it's on the way. It's on the way. Uh, let me see. I can what was see the article here. about? <sighs> the hard questions. The hard questions. Okay. All right. This one has been penned by who? Let me see. Veronica Odongo says, King Charles' visit to Kenya uh, strengthens bonds and shapes the future regardless of the past. All right. I'll put a pin in it. We'll come back to it if we have time. Uh, but on the question of intra-African trade, the president did make a declaration. Um, uh, just leave it at a safe page. There we go. <laughs> Uh, did uh, make a declaration but that by December the 31st, uh, Kenya would be open for business from Africans. Uh, it's, it's an endeavor that his predecessor began, President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta. How uh, feasible is that in your opinion? I think, first of all, I think it's a very good thing mm -hmm. because, and, and speaking of barriers uh, to, to trade, you can't trade across borders if people can't move freely. So I think it's, it's, it's a good thing. But you see, there is usually a reason why uh, movement across borders is, is restricted. And, and one of them is, is just crime. That these people come, I mean, outsiders come, and you're not able to exactly manage manage them. You don't know whether they're going to commit crimes. You don't know if they're good people. And that is why where the other country comes in, the other country should be able to assure you that we are sending you these people and they're going to behave themselves. So can we ensure if we open it up to all African countries, are we going to be able to manage it? That, that is the question. Of course, you, you, you'd assume that the majority of these are good folks they are only interested in their business. They come to Kenya and they go and there are no issues. But that's not always going to be the case. There are going to be some criminal elements, for example. How do you deal with the crime? Are we, are we ready to handle the criminal elements? Do we have reciprocal agreements with the countries that are sending them so that in case they commit crimes, we're able to manage it, mm -hmm. for example? Yes. Um, Already, uh, we can go, for example, in speaking of reciprocity, yeah. we can get, if I understand it correctly, a visa on arrival for, what, three months? Yes. Yeah, with, with South Africa? With South Africa. Yes. yes. Uh, but, uh, Prof, your initial thoughts? I think this is a good idea. No question about it. We need free movement of people from mm -hmm. uh, one country to another. But let's also be sincere and, uh, and accept that, as mathematicians will say, is a necessary but not sufficient condition for trade to flourish. We need more than just visas. For example, you need to think about the infrastructure. If I want to move from here to Congo or to Mauritania or another country, it will not, it will not be that easy. There was a joke in, I think it was in this paper, where a, a, a consignment of tea was shipped from Kenya in October and it arrived in Ghana in February the following year. So we must make sure that there is infrastructure. <laughs> And another very interesting... From October to February? That's what I saw in that business daily. I think it went by, by ship. But we need to improve, to improve our infrastructure. But another one that we often forget is our cultures. We don't understand each other very well. So if you have to move from, uh, let's say, Kenya to go and trade in Ghana, to go and trade in Ethiopia, to go and trade in another country, I need to understand those people. And that is one area our curriculum has not really focused on. And that's because I, I know people who have passports that they have expired without ever traveling. Uh, and they have been saying, I have a passport, but I've never used it. So it's not just enough to let people travel visa free. We need to include the ecosystem that makes people travel for business, for Asia, for tourism, and so on. All right. So aside from um, the security concerns, Okay, let's just look at some data, right? So as I mentioned, this is one of the issues we'll be looking at during the just zoom in here, Kusi Ideas Festival, um, Africa's Agenda 2063, making the dream come true progress and freedom of movement. movement. Uh, for Africans to prosper, Africans need to be able to move. Uh, this quotes, uh, I, I quoted this to you yesterday, did I not? Um, and this is the Africa Development Bank president. Just 19% of 1,000 of 1,431 potential routes between the African Union countries uh, had some form of weekly direct air service, a recent IATA report found. So just 19% of 
48, the number of countries out of uh, 54, offer visa-free travel to at least one other African country. And the source there is the African Development Bank. And 45% intra-African flights are 45% more expensive than other flights across the globe with poor connectivity in parts of the continent. So it's, just, it's not just about opening up. Uh, to other Africans. This is also about, and it's also about connectivity. How accessible are these other countries uh, to us? This I don't think surprises you, Professor Mikaya Ketch. No, it, it, it doesn't. I mean, I, I travel uh, on this continent quite, quite a lot. Eh? And uh, just to give you an example, the Central African Republic borders Cameroon. Mm -hmm. But it could take you, if you were to move by air, it's a journey that if you are going by road, it would take you some two or so hours. Eh? If you are to go by air, it would take you days because of the complicated uh, air travel arrangements that we have on, on, on the continent. And it's complicated because, you see, a country must grant you access to their airspace to be able to, to, to move goods or, or people across that airspace, and that doesn't always happen. So you'll find that in many cases, if I want, if I want to go to, let's say, North Africa, I have to go, to go out of the continent, probably to Dubai or to Turkey, and then come back in, or even to France. It, it's ridiculous. And imagine the barriers that go with it, because if I have to go to France, then they'll have to give me a transit visa. And mm. how long will it take? So it, 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 it becomes very, very complicated uh, traveling okay. on this continent. Uh, uh, Professor Exxon Iraq, you can hear his passport, he's stamped. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> I travel for work, even within Kenya, as in for leisure, you know, maybe twice or thrice a year, and, and then to very specific places. I'm not very adventurous, you know, the traditional routes. Uh, but perhaps we should do more of that tra type of traveling. But in terms of uh, connectivity, why is it more difficult, uh, have you found, to travel within our own continent? Because, uh, because first of all, it's expensive to, to bring connectivity. You need to build loads, you need to build railways. You need to come up with the airlines that compete. The last time I was going to my colleague, the last time I was going to uh, Morocco from Kenya, I had to take a flight to Dubai, then another flight across another 13 hours to, to Morocco. So we need to invest in infrastructure. So if I want to go from like Mombasa to Kinshasa, mm -hmm. maybe I have to go through South Africa or I have to go through an airport. But I would, I, would, I, would, I would have been very happy if I had a choice of taking a train, taking a bus, uh, driving my own car. So we have not yet invested heavily in uh, infrastructure. And you need to go to the US, for example, and see how much they have done with their interstate system mm -hmm. that can take you from every place. If even the smallest towns have airports. So you have a lot of choices on how to travel. Mm. So, so we need to invest in that, and it's expensive. Just look at how much it costed us to build just SGR from Mombasa to, Na to, to Naivasha. So if you have to connect the rest of Africa, either using roads, using railways, it's very expensive. So we must get to invest in that. And, and speaking on, of investments in rail, uh, we had the BRI summit uh, in China uh, just the other day. President William Ruto was there, and the East African did a piece about how we went looking for funding to extend the SGR from... Naivasha to Malaba, from Malaba to uh, into the DRC, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, and then yeah. to Congo Brazzaville. Uh, didn't quite pan out as, as had been hoped on account of Uganda. And apparently they're already in, in some type of uh, arrangement with the Turkish, but uh, they did say there's some room, some wiggle room where the financing is concerned. Um, is that really at the crux of the matter? Getting investment partner, the fact that Africa has been unable to finance um, its own development where connectivity is concerned, do you think? Infrastructure is critical. You know, the, the, the funny thing is that uh, these are conversations that um, the, the leadership of, of uh, African states and the African Union in particular have been having for a very long time. And they've made commitments mm. over, mm -hmm. um, over decades. They've mm. made commitments. We'll have a single air transport uh, market. Uh, we, we'll have uh, infrastructure like road and rail infrastructure. 
across the entire continent. You know, we've been talking about the tr transatlantic African highway, mm -hmm. for example. And um, we even have an ambassador. Uh, the, the former Prime Minister, Raila Odinga, has been the spearheading a similar initiative. Yes. So the, the question, and this is usually the problem in, in this continent, the gap between what we say we're going to do and, and what we actually do tends to be very, very wide. But if you look at it in terms of uh, the agreements that, that, that the member states of the African Union sign up to so that they achieve these things, they have all of them. Like the, this, this thing of uh, the single uh, air transport market, mm -hmm. there's been an agreement on it. How many countries have signed up to it? Not very many, unfortunately. What do you think that is about? It's, it's difficult to say, but part of it has to do with the fact that um, if you're looking at, at, at uh, the, the restriction that, that countries impose on, on, on the air market, for example, they derive certain revenues from it. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's the, there is income that is going to be lost. So our country has to be persuaded that, look, you're going to gain more by having this single uh, air transport market in the long run. Yes, you lose some income in, in the short term, but in the long run you're going to gain. And then, of course, there's our politics. We, we don't, no, we're not always very democratic in, 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 many, in many of these countries. So there's a fear that, you know, if you're too open, then you'll be vulnerable to, to uh, takeovers and, and, and those kinds of things. So those, there are insecurities as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. So and, and at the same time, so you need to be working on, on our democratization uh, project as well. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, and then I'll get more into that because even within Africa, we, 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 you hear about xenophobia, you know, people are concerned about people, other people taking their jobs and all of, even as Africans, how open are we to this idea? Uh, but uh, before we get into that, we're happy to go and conquer other lands, but perhaps not <laughs> as happy to have other people come and conquer in a figurative sense. I'm just using conquer because of the king, <laughs> the king's visit. But uh, Professor XN Iraqi, this, to open up Africa, this would be a heavy investment, right? Uh, those who hold the past strings uh, would be looking to get something out of the deal. And so I know Africa has been touted as uh, the next frontier, right? Because of our youthful population. Uh, so we have an untapped market as it were. But how do we reverse course of that one? If should they partner with us in this endeavor, that it will just not be about extraction, Thank not just of uh, our, our whatever, our, what do I call them? Our um, raw material. Uh, and not just about, not the, just about extracting our best minds, but... Uh, and not dumping enough. It's a complicated conversation, is it not? We need the money, but then we also need to have some level of uh, sovereignty over our assets. But, but, but I think, to, with all due respect, uh, mm -hmm. I think we focus too much on foreign investors. Mm -hmm. And I want to be a bit brutal. Mm -hmm. If I was given a chance to start a special purpose vehicle, I can guarantee you I could get enough investors to build Expressway, and we make money out of it. Was raising 80 billion in the continent. No, in Kenya. Don't yeah. even to go outside the Kenya. Mm. Outside the Kenya. The other day I saw statistics that about uh, we probably we probably take about 80 billion Kenyan shillings in betting only. I think in six months. So if you can believe in ourselves, we can we can raise that money. It is here. The other day BAT wanted uh, was it BAT or KBL? They wanted to raise 11 billion in a board. They raise 37 billion. So create there's a lot of money around that we can mobilize and do the investment. So we don't just need to rely on foreign investors. But we also need to be more realistic. Mm -hmm. From my history, Indians used to come from India or Oman, Oman used to come from Middle East to Kenya for thousands of years. They used to use boats, the Dawes. Eh? But today I cannot take a ship or a boat from Mombasa to Ramu. And the sea is there. If I want to go to Dar es Salaam, I can't take a boat from Dar es Salaam, from Mombasa to Dar es Salaam or to Zanzibar. 
So even where infra infrastructure is there, made by nature, we don't exploit it. Why should I be driving from Kisumu to, to Kampara or to, to Bukoba when there is a, a lake there? So we are, I think we have also not been creative enough in exploiting what we have. So let's get foreign investors, but let, let's also invest. When we're having this uh, conversation, uh, Professor Akech, in preparation for the show, you were saying we need to stop, look, we need to look, or is it you, Professor X and Iraq, that we need to find a way to overcome these boundaries that were imposed on us by our colonialists. Was it you, Professor X and Iraq? Yeah, but, but I've always been, uh, <laughs> it's very interesting. I had a rumor the other day in the country, uh -huh. right? We were supposed to build a road from one country to another. Uh -huh. And then the, 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 the people who live in that place were saying, we don't, we don't want a road. Because if you build a road, certain communities will come. <laughs> they will come and buy our land and they, start, they take all the businesses. So I agree with you. There is a lot of fear that if, let's say, Kenyans started traveling to Uganda in large numbers, or Tanzania in large numbers, they will overwhelm the country. But we have no problem having Chinese come here, or Americans come here, or Japanese come here. We are very happy. We welcome them. Mm -hmm. So why are we afraid of our own brothers? They invest we, like any other. Uh -huh. So that colonial mentality that uh, certain people are better than others, we need to overcome it. And that's why I said we need to put more emphasis on understanding our neighbors because we don't understand them. All we know about Tanzanians, Ethiopians, Cameroonians is just based on prejudice, not based on reality. But it's also paradoxical because one way to understand those people is to travel more. So that you go to Ghana, you stay with them, you go to Ethiopia, you stay with them. Then you realize those people are not that bad, they are like anybody else. The same way you realize that if you come to the countryside and mix with other nationalities in national schools or universities, you realize not all people from Kambara like Yero, not all people from, <laughs> uh, from rural land. Eat fish. You realize we are, we are not that different. Not all, I'm not sure about that one for yellow. <laughs> but uh, we need to take a break. Uh, we come back on the other side uh, with more on this conversation. Professor Miguel Ketch in a studio as well as uh, Professor X and Iraqi. I'm so sorry. I didn't even use your titles. Economist. No, I'm very happy using the title as I am. Okay. Uh, columnist. Uh, we also have international trade expert as well as uh, governance specialist. So uh, we'll get their thoughts on this conversation. Moving on. If you use our titles, you also have to add that up. world that's constantly on the move, where every day counts, it's time to pause, reflect and secure your tomorrow. It's more than just setting money aside, it's about building a foundation for your dreams. This Tuesday, in celebration of World Savings Day, NTV engages strategic partners, prominent experts and a renowned moderator for a live panel discussion to dive deep into the world of savings in Kenya. Catch the discussion live on NTV and simultaneously stream on our social media platforms this Tuesday, 31st October from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. And find out why savings are important and get advice to help you make the most of your hard-earned money. from pain. That moment when you start to get back to ordinary and ordinary feels amazing. Whatever pain you're going through, release starts here. Are you guys mad? Bridget may be unique or whatever you want to call it, but to do something like that to Alberto? No, forget it, no. Mm. Tell you something, Carmen. The sketchy establishment where your son is working with Haiba is not a restaurant. It's a brothel. It's nothing but a disgusting bordello that they're trying to disguise what as a diner. What did you diner. say? I have my own proposal that should satisfy everyone. I will give you 10% more than what Irene and Diego offered you. 
Head Over Heels. Head Over Heels in association with Ariel. Me upata clean and fresh results. Promotion moja tu. Ariel ndio siri yangu. Sasa story yangu iko popular sana. Ariel, usafi bora kwa mosho mmoja tu. visit nation.africa to catch the best of lifestyle and entertainment keep an eye on education and gender issues get electrified with the latest sporting action stay informed as we unravel intriguing undercover investigative stories and enjoy comprehensive coverage from award-winning journalism and reporting, including politics, expert opinion, and breaking news. Settle for more content in great packages on any device. Subscribe today for exclusive premium content. Visit nation.africa. Nation.africa. Positively empowering society. All holders are notified to report and surrender unclaimed financial assets to the Unclaimed Financial Assets Authority, UFAA, on or before November 1st, 2023. Visit www.ufaa.go.ke and get started. All right, welcome back to AM. No, 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 no. Welcome back to a you're safe. AM Live. Uh, push for justice for Andrew McLeod King Charles's visit. This is what I was looking for. A chilling case casts a long shadow over the visit by King Charles III this week, 11 years since the murder of Agnes Wanjiro, allegedly committed in cold blood by a British soldier. The case remains unsolved. Her murder resonates with the grim ledger of Britain's transgressions on Kenyan soil, including brutality during colonization. Uh, this particular report in The Standard uh, filed and published uh, yesterday. Uh, by Brian Obara and Mwangi Maina. We del they delved into the depths of this troubling case, speaking with Kenyan investigators and a British journalist who unearthed the horrifying details of the murder. So um, uh, just to refresh your memory, uh, here we go. Um, the past decade has condemned Wanjiru's family to a perpetual state of anxious limbo. They continue to grapple with the enduring pain of their loss while steadfastly demanding justice. And uh, Wanjiru's elder sister and uh, guardian of her 11-year-old daughter, Lo uh, Rose uh, Wanyua, expressed an unwavering plea that justice is all we want. Wanyua lamented the apparent disregard for the murder case by authorities, attributing it to their modest economically disadvantaged um, uh, background and, and the story uh, goes on but here is a quote the killers who are known in London are walking free uh, and Joki stated from Majengo Nanyuki and uh, let me see um, Esther Njoki is Wanjiru's 19 year old niece and she conveyed the pain and trauma that her family has endured 11 years since her aunt's passing a 2019 inquest conducted by a Nanyuki magistrate yielded the distressing conclusion that Wanjiru likely remained alive when she was thrown into the septic tank, her body bearing signs of physical abuse and stab wounds. In further revelation, a 2021 investigation by the Sunday Times, a British newspaper, unveiled shocking details. It disclosed that a Br British soldier had been shamelessly boasting to his comrades about being uh, responsible for her death. Moreover, another soldier had reportedly disclosed to local police that the implicated soldier had even exhibited Wanjiru's lifeless body back to him in 2012. Uh, body to him back in 2012, further compounding the gravity of the matter. Despite this, even the name of the alleged culprit is yet to be made public. Uh, the Times, apparently fearful of a lawsuit, has only published a blood photo of um, the 
Bain suspect Wajiru's family places the blame for the sluggish pace of the inquiry squarely on the Kenyan government, accusing it of conducting shoddy investigations that have only deepened their pain and left them without closure. And uh, Wanjiru's daughter, uh, and uh, Njoki revealed that Wanjiru's daughter constantly asks about her missing mother, heartbreaking reminder of their ongoing agony. All right, so yeah, this is uh, the report uh, I was looking for, found it. Uh, so I, I will bring us back. I know I've done a little bit of moving, jumping here and there uh, this morning, but again, now back to the topic at hand, and uh, we're discussing intra-African trade. But just, just to trade. comment mm -hmm. on that, you see, that, that is a problem. When you go to, um, to someone else's country, you should be subject to their law. You cannot be going to another country committing crimes and you're exempt from uh, being held accountable. But that is precisely what this agreement between the uh, Kenya and, and the British uh, army does. Although this family them. lays the blame at the doorstep of Kenyan authorities. Yes, but the problem is that those soldiers are not subject to Kenyan law. If they were subject to Kenyan law, that individual, as soon as there was suspicion that he had committed the crime, would not have even left this jurisdiction. They'd have been taken to court. Okay. Precisely, yes. All right. Okay. Uh, Prof, I can move, Professor Iraki, I can move back to intra-African... Yeah, we can move back to intra-African okay. intra trade. Intra trade. Yes. Because so, we, if, if we start talking about uh, justice, <laughs> we, can now, <laughs> we can add other people to Wanjiro. Mm -hmm. Because as I said earlier, I know people who are detained by the Britons for many years for nothing. They lost their land, they lost uh, inheritance because of that. And uh, they, they committed no crime. Mm. So that's why I'm saying we need to look back into the past and come to reality with the truth. Whether you are British, whether you are Kenyan, let's face historical truth. Actually, you should not keep on haunting us. And the ghosts of, uh, of whatever land injustice has to continue to haunt us yes. um, to this day. But Professor Akech, my question then is this. So... We open up uh, Kenya to investors uh, from the African continent because, Prof, you have told us we need to stop focusing on foreign investment. Uh, but then many countries may not reciprocate on account of even among ourselves on the, con on the continent, we have certain, even ourselves as Kenyans, Prejudices. Prejudices. Yes. Yeah, that, that seems like quite the hurdle to overcome. But I, I suppose this is, is, as Prof said, a step in the right direction. The more we are exposed to each other, uh, the, the better the relationships moving forward. It, it's, it's un, certainly is true. Um, and I can only give my, my own ex experience in this. So I've lived in South Africa. I lived in South Africa for, uh, for three years. And... Um, when you hear of South Africa, what is the first word that comes to Xenophobia. Mind? But that is not my experience living in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I think South Africans are wonderful people. They have terrific humor. I felt very much at home. I, I feel, sometimes I feel more at home in Johannesburg than I feel in Nairobi. But it is because of uh, having that spirit of... Uh, let me just... Ubuntu. Exactly, but I mean, it, it's, 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 it's having an adventurous spirit and saying, let me go and find out how these people uh, live. You know, let me not have, let me not prejudge them, let me be open-minded. And it will, the only way to do that is by traveling. If we stay here, we'll, we'll, we'll stay here with our prejudices. If we travel and they travel this way, we'll overcome those prejudices. Because I don't think, I mean, mm -hmm. across this continent, again, I travel a lot across this continent. And what I see, uh, Africans are very similar in, in, in many ways. Even in terms of, of, of how very ordinary things, Africans are very, very similar. We are more alike than we are different. You, I had to say it's true. In fact, the problem is not Africans, ordinary people like you and me, as our politicians, who make us see our differences. Mm -hmm. When I go to U.S., for example, and walk on the streets, until I speak, nobody knows I'm not from there. And when I go to Ghana or other African countries, as he puts it, as a, it's only when you talk to the leader, you're not one of us. But when you sit with them, 
of a, a beer or a cup of tea and you start talking, you realize the joke, the same jokes, the same everything, the same struggles you go through. So we, we are very much similar, but people need to focus on that similar, no differences. Even when I went to Nigeria, uh, the, what I read in, in things for apart and all things about Nigeria, I thought I would not even get out of the airport, but I found myself very much at home. That's why I'm saying let's travel and see what happens elsewhere. But the biggest, the main reason why we need this visas to be removed is economic. Mm -hmm. There is enough research that shows that immigrants make better entrepreneurs. So the more people travel from one country to another, the more entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs you get. Actually, we'd need more detail on this because there's various levels of a visa, right? Like yeah. to work, you would need a work visa mm -hmm. and all of that. So when he says visa restrictions, does he mean across the board? But, Prof, sorry to cut you short. You're saying migrants are... are immigrants, research shows migrants... Imi make, immigrants mm -hmm. normally make very good entrepreneurs. Look at Nairobi. Nairobi contributes about 25% of Kenya's GDP. It has about 70% of Kenya's land mass. But why are Nairobians so enterprising? It's because they move. You come from your village, I come from my village, we come here. We are valued for our brains, not our appearances or our language. So if we did that on the African scale, so that if I have an idea that I believe can work better in Nigeria, I go there. If a Nigerian has an idea that he believes can work better in Morocco, he, will, he goes there. Because if you start being an entrepreneur in your village, where everybody knows you, you are not very much supported. But when you go, you flourish. So let's have people move from one country to another. Actually, that mm -hmm. is very true. And, and, and in my experience, you'd be surprised, but Africans travel a lot. And, and f business travel, I'm talking about um, mm -hmm. the, your small and medium term enterprises. I see a lot of uh, travel across countries. I mean, just to give you an example between South Africa and Kenya, there are very many Kenyans who go to South Africa to, to buy, whether it is fruits or um, most, mostly, mostly fruits to, to bring to, to, uh, to Kenya, and they transport it by, by road. Yeah. It's, it's actually faster to, tra to transport it by road than, than uh, by, by sea, for mm -hmm. example, or by, usually they use a uh, road. I think it's, 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 it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. And then vice versa. A lot of South Africans also come, come this way. So it's, it's not that uh, Africans are not, are, are not traveling as such. It's just that there are very many restrictions. Uh, we talk of uh, free movement. We talk of uh, reducing barriers to trade under the African continental free trade area. But when you look at practice, despite the fact that a lot of people are willing to venture outside their countries, they face a lot of restrictions. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you read the papers recently, you've, you've, you've seen, for example, people complaining about how foreign, foreigners are treated at uh, Jomo Kenyatta International Airport in terms of uh, inspection of, of their bags, and, and, and it's not very, uh, it's not done very well. It's, it's, it's abusive in, in many instances. Why should people come to our country if that is the kind of treatment that we're going to, to subject them to? Because what, I mean, people will share the negative travels very quickly. They'll, they'll share those negative stories and people say, no, I'm not going to Kenya. Despite Kenya saying, you know, we are open, but when you come, in terms of the practicalities, you, you find a different experience. Mm -hmm. So we impose, yes, you know, we've said, okay, let's reduce taxes and stuff like that on, on goods and services. But when you come, we impose, we call them non-tariff barriers mm -hmm. in, in, in trade law terms. Eh? And there are these little things. I mean, it's, it's how somebody is treated at the point, at the port of entry, for example. Those things matter. Let me give you a good example. Now that, now that he has raised the, the small things, mm -hmm. I'm not boasting, I'm just informing you. I went to Canada recently. And what surprised me is, you go, when you queue for immigration, you scan your passport, you ask a few questions, mm -hmm. then you walk out. You don't need an immigration officer anywhere. Is that, nobody who opens your passport like no, this and looks no. at you through I that plexiglass? I, I even had to ask a policeman, is that true? And he told me, welcome to Canada, and I went. And I remember I went to another Eastern, Afri Eastern country, Taiwan. And when I was coming out, I scanned my passport. Nobody, nobody checked anything. 
And I, I, go to, I went to the airport. So the small things he's talking about matters a lot. Because when I come to Kenya, the first impression is who I meet. Does he smile to me? Does he tell me welcome? Does he ask, can you open your bag? What are you carrying? Those small things matter. So we might open the country, but are we going to open our minds? Mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing. And that's what my friend is saying. Okay. <laughs> this is more opportunity for Kitu. Kidogo, how did, well, how did <laughs> Raila Odinga, he said kuna kitu kidogo, kitu kubwa and the TK, everything. Yeah. Um, but do we have the security infrastructure in your view to handle this opening up of our borders? And I ask that because if we are to say to Africans, Somalis are Africans, um, which are the South Sudanese? Are Africans already there in the country? We, we see them. Um, the DRC, which is experiencing some conflict in some areas, are Africans. So, when is somebody a visitor? When are they a refugee? But 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 that is why where the, recipro the reciprocity agreements coming. This is where countries now share intelligence, and and that's why um, Iraq is talking about. The experience, I mean, his experience in Canada, where all they do is they scan your passport. Because in doing that, they have all your data. They'll know that this is a, a law abiding citizen, he does not pose a threat to us, and they leave you alone. Because they've shared, they have uh, a capacity for sharing intelligence, which we do, but do we use it? And they even give you a visa. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, by, by the time you're given a, a, a visa, you've answered all sorts of questions about your background, about what it is that you intend to do in the other country. So they know everything about you. So they should not then fear you if they already know that this is somebody who's only come here for business. Let them, let, let us leave them, him or her, to do whatever it is that brought them here in peace. We have the... If we share intelligence, why should it be a problem? Why should security be, be a problem? I don't think it should. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you, a, let me respond to what my friend is saying in another way. Mm. You really have problem with the people you trade with. So if people are coming to trade here, make money, and we go to another country to make money, why should we cause trouble? So as the economy grows, people realize I'm getting from Tanzania. So I should even be the first person to report any suspicious character because if there's trouble in Tanzania, our rules. So if we, we, we do more trade, we have more entrepreneurs moving, then they'll see advantage of trade, whether they are Somalis, whether they are Ethiopians, and then you have less trouble. In fact, research has shown that since European Union came into being, there has been more peace in that country, in European Union in general. So when we start, start integrating the African countries, trade more, make more money, there will be less criminals and less problems. And then they even identify as Europeans. We don't yet identify as Africans That's right. mm -hmm. because we don't know one another. Mm. Yes. Uh, the other concern is black market trade. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I thought that would not come, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a reality. In... <laughs> Are we biting off more than we can chew or we need to relax? But I think we, we need to ask ourselves why the black market thrives. Uh -huh. and, and I would even put in that category just in informal trade. Why, why, why does informal trade uh, occur? Um, I've had a, a PhD student, for example, studying that exactly, that phenomenon um, across the the Malawian and, and, and Tanzanian border. Why does it occur? It occurs a lot because of the conditions that traders face across the border. The things that are imposed on them by the tax authorities, for example. And part of it is because the tax authorities abuse their powers. So if I'm going to go to, uh, to the border, I'm a, just an ordinary law-abiding trader, and then they're going to ask me to pay more taxes than I really should because they feel they have the power. What is my inclination? My inclination is to find a panya route. Mm -hmm. I will not. I will 
then not go to the border post, I'll find another route. It's not because I don't want to comply with the law, it's because of how they treat me when I get there. And they make it impossible for me to trade by imposing taxes that shouldn't even be there. That happens a lot. So I think, and, 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 and we have to be realistic, especially mm. in this continent. Also by opening up the borders, mm -hmm. we are somehow addressing. Yes, but we need to, the person that is going to enhance intra-African trade mm -hmm. is that small trader. Mm -hmm. So we need to make the conditions conducive for that small trader. So that that small trader does not have the incentive to smuggle. To smuggle. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, uh, Prof. Exen Iraqi. Brack, you talked of Brack market? Yes. Yes. Uh, I don't like that term mm -hmm. because I, I one time had a problem with it. I was in a US classroom mm -hmm. and I had Brack students and I talked about the Brack market, the Brack economy. And you can be sure how the Brack students were up in arms. Mm -hmm. So probably I would talk about other ground economy or something like that okay, or black okay. markets. Mm -hmm. And you can be sure that between me and you are more bracker than you. That's the other reason why I'm talking about it. Eh? <laughs> and that's why I'm talking <laughs> of the informal Formal. economy. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, Sorry, uh, I was politically incorrect. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, you are okay. Now, I think the reason why black market or other ground economy thrives is when you overregulate. Mm -hmm. People are always look for shortcuts. So if you make the trade open, people know the rules, people know the regulations, and the people who are supposed to make sure there's compliance, do their work. There will be no reason need for black economy. It, it's the same as the, if I'm on the highway, the policeman stops me for overspeeding. And he told me you have been over by 10 kilometers. Your charge is 5,000. 5, 5, I'll probably pay using M-Pesa if that was possible and go where I was going. Because I might be making more money than that where I'm going. Mm -hmm. But if you now give me a boat, tell me the boat is 20,000. You have to go to attend a court in Nakuru, I mean, Nairobi. I mm -hmm. have to spend a whole day. Mm. Then you probably ask me in a situonge on the side. Mm. The temptation to say, to, to talk, mm -hmm. would be very high. Mm. But if the rules were very, 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 I know this is the overspeeding, the charge you pay using M-Pesa and you go. So as we open the economy, or as we start giving people visas, we must also look at the whole ecosystem, the legal part of it, the ICT part of it, the social part of it. It's not just a question of giving people visas to come. You also must look at their drying, their drying issues, mm -hmm. like the regulations. And uh, we have a lawyer here. He'll tell you that once you have a regulate things, people look for shortcuts. So, but <laughs> the tax regime, you know, yesterday some of the memes I saw um, included, uh, this was evidently just uh, photoshopped, uh, um, <laughs> Run like you're running from KRA and then during the marathon. And then the other one was you run better than government, <laughs> uh, but on a light note there. Um, the local traders and the, and the present tax regime uh, argue that it, it, it prohibits them from being competitive, right? Uh, especially when you consider the cheaper imports from China and, and the like. Um, and then, so how would we, how would this work if we were to foster intra-African trade. How would the taxation work, for instance? You know, from, from, a, from a, at, at, let me, the, those taxes, we call them tariffs, huh? mm -hmm. in, 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 again, in, in, trade, in trade law uh, or trade, trade terms. Huh? Mm -hmm. The idea is to foster competition across the continent, eh? mm -hmm. and there are trade-offs. Countries make trade-offs. They, they, they say that, uh, well, in the short run, Kenya may lose markets, uh, more specific markets. Eh? But in the, long term, in, the, in the long run, if you look at the entire economy, there will be benefits. The challenge then becomes convincing the people that are going to lose mm -hmm that it will be worth their while. That, that's going to be the challenge for, for governments. And that is why it's also very difficult for countries to enter into these uh, trade agreements. Because you see, you have to cater for these local constituencies. If you don't, you're going to lose votes, for example. Assuming, of course, that uh, the electoral process works, mm -hmm. which is uh, an entirely different uh, 
conversation. I think power in Africa mostly is taken. It's not, it's not by the ballot. Eh? Yeah. Somebody decides I'm taking power and they do it, whether through elections or other means. Eh? But I digress. So I think the, the, the challenge is then persuading these people that are going to lose it, that they, they, they benefit in the long term. And, and you can do it through different means. You can say that um, we're going to support this market or this, 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 this market that, that may lose in the short term. We're going to support you to compete in the long term. And we can give you all kinds of in incentives. You can tax you less. We can give you subsidies. Um, we can help you with your research of the other market so that it's easier for you. So these are the things that, that you, a government would then need to do. But the government will then need to convince the other um, parties to the agreement that this is necessary. So they'll say, we are lowering, yes, we, we want goods from your country to come in. But in the meantime, please allow us to do this so that we can persuade the group that is going to lose that in five or six or seven years time, they'll be at par and they'll be making money. Already, Prof, even within the East African community, yes, to Konashida na mayai kuku cheaper eggs coming in from where? Is mm -hmm. it Uganda? From Uganda. From Uganda. Yeah. Onions from Milk. Tanzania. Mm -hmm. You will see farmers here saying, oh, "We are throwing our tomatoes away and etc. and etc. and etc." Yes. Uh, already within the ESC, we have quite not managed to negotiate some of these things. We were burning things at the border the other day. Yeah. Uh, we were saying your flights from whatever restricted just the other day, just within um, EAC. EAC. Yes. So the politics of it, I think you mentioned this already, is, is cannot be understated. Yes, but you see, and, and that is why when, when countries negotiate, when they, they say that they, they bind their tariffs and they do it at... Um, at a higher level, meaning that they give room for maneuver, which is to say that we have room to play the politics. Because markets are seasonal. A lot of these markets are, are se seasonal. There'll be gluts, there'll be fluctuations. So a country should be able to persuade the losing producers, for example, that uh, we have room within the agreement. If you feel that imports from Uganda the, um, the eggs that you're talking about from Uganda are hurting the Kenyan economy, then we have room to raise the taxes so that we protect you for a season. So that's how they, they manage the, the, the politics. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that makes sense. It does, it does. Uh, but uh, Professor Iraqi, we have fishermen being arrested. They cross over to the wrong side of, of, uh, around the Migingo. Uh, island <laughs> <laughs> which I find very strange because fish have no borders uh -huh. but, but I think the big issue my colleague is bringing here is when you think of opening the markets trade negotiations becomes a very big business so you must be able to negotiate and amicably negotiate because we don't want country to complain that they are losing others are gaining but ultimately you talked about tax tax is a very good incentive to let to encourage people to either trade more or trade less so eventually one of the areas we must look at in opening our borders is how we are going to deal with the tax regime. Because tax can make things cheaper, more expensive. It can encourage people to produce more, produce less. But I think the biggest advantage we are going to get from opening our borders across Africa is competition. And the competition is very good because customers will get uh, lower prices when you compete. And very important, you get out of innovations. So there will be a lot of innovations when people compete one country and another, one region and another. And eventually the customers will benefit, the economy will grow, all of us will be happier, and that's all that we want. We cannot, I cannot discount what you said a few minutes ago that politics will always be there. But that's the reality of life. You cannot direct disconnect politics and economics completely. They will always be interacting in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So we must, when, when you make such policy statements about removing visas, bring everybody aboard, aboard politicians, the traders, even uh, even churches, because uh, I've seen out of inter intercountry churches also from West Africa being imported into this country. Uh -huh. So we must look at all those issues in totality. Okay. And, and then when we are talking about tax, eh, uh -huh. 
the administration of, 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 of tax is key. If you talk to um, small businesses in this country, they feel oppressed by, by care in terms of how it administers tax. Compared to, so if you are a big business in this country and you have tax issues, you can easily hire a tax consulting firm like PwC mm -hmm. and they'll sort it out. They negotiate with, with uh, KRA and that will be the end of the matter. It's easier for, life, for big businesses. But if you're a small business, just to mention that um, of somebody from KRA has come to visit you can be very stressful because then it requires that you invest in dealing with care eh, in mm -hmm. terms of how it administers tax, tax, which is not always fair, yes. particularly for these uh, small businesses. So again, you'd want to, to say that there is fair, fairness in how tax is administered and the experience is the same, whether you're a large business or you're a small business, which I, I don't think is the case in, in this country. I think what my colleague is saying is that in opening the borders, giving people visa, visa the reaction mm -hmm. should be multifaceted. So that is not just a question of immigration, but all the people in that supply chain, traders, KRA, and everybody. The other day I asked a group of uh, business people what they fear most. I know they would say dishonest business people, they would say uh, bad guys, but one of the things they told me is KRA, and he's very right. As an individual, if I'm confronted by KRA, I'm helpless. But if a big company like BAT or EAB or Safaricom gets inquiries from KRA, they will get lawyers, they will get consultants, they, the case will be sorted out. So as these small traders start crossing into Kenya, will they become victims of what they perceive as very strong KRA? If I go to Zambia or I go to another country to, to do business, shall I be a victim? Shall I feel I'm a victim of the same? So we must also look at the playground. So that, remember at the end of the day, we are not encouraging the big businesses to cross from one country to another. They are already mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. What we want is the small businesses to expand by expat, exporting to other countries. And we must support them in all ways. All right. So I will put a pin in that uh, discussion. I will invite them back in studio, although I must apologize th to them because I was doing a ping pong between the royal visit and <laughs> <laughs> intra-African trade. Uh, but uh, that is it for AM Live this morning. Professor Migai Akech, he is, as you heard, uh, inter international trade expert. Uh, he is an advocate uh, of uh, the High Court. Uh, we also have, and he's also a governance specialist. We have uh, an economist in studio, columnist, and Dari negotiator in studio as well. <laughs> Professor X N E Iraqi, gentlemen, thank you for being such good sports. Uh, I apologize for the ping pong and even more ping pong because I'm coming back with your world. And guess what we are discussing? Midlife crisis. <laughs> I even forgot to ask you guys, right? Because I did see the story in the, on the front page of the papers. But uh, there's this Friends star, Matthew Perry, who passed away at 54. Uh, over the weekend, uh, I don't know. Did you, Prof? You are you generation of your Jamaica money, or did you? Are you familiar? When I say friends, do you know what I mean? Actually, we are we are about uh, the same uh, age set with, with Pele. Uh -huh. I don't know much about him, but I saw he lived a very troubled life. Mm. Maybe he did not handle his midlife crisis properly. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Miguel Akech, are you your Jamaica money generation? Or? Both. Both. Yes, I, I enjoyed uh, Biojama common. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, and friends as well. And friends as well. Yes. All right. Um, <laughs> you did tell us about your, millennials. You eh? tell us about your generation. But <laughs> Tyra Swift. Thanks, Prof. That's flattering. <laughs> well, that's it for AM Live. My name is Olivares. Coming up next with your world. <laughs>